We have talked about ground state of many electron atoms, helium and lithium to be more precise. Now we talk about uh, the excited states. Why is it that we must talk about excited states? First of all let us not forget that one of the beginnings of quantum mechanics is in spectroscopy and spectroscopy involves transitions uh, between ground and excited states. Secondly uh, well maybe not secondly uh, another way of saying it is that all the color that we see all around us right we live in a colorful world all the color that we see is because of transitions involving ground and excited states. And finally it is not only color but lot of reactions that take place the very fact that we see is uh, something that involves excited state. Photosynthesis something that we are all familiar with involves excited state processes. So, uh, it is not sufficient to restrict our discussion to ground states, we must understand excited states as well. Of course, uh, building descriptions for excited states is much more complicated than ground states, but uh, what we achieve to what we try to do uh, in this course, our uh, goals are not very, very high, we will be able to do it and get an idea of what exactly is done, right. And on a lighter note, uh, we often do things better when uh, we are excited. Same holds for atoms and molecules. Many times they do things better whatever they are supposed to do when they are excited by light by absorbing light. So, uh, that leads to all the photochemistry around us. So, let us not neglect excited state, let us learn how to study that. But before going there, uh, what we have learned so far is about spin orbitals, spin orbitals ok. Let me for once define a spin orbital because I do not think I have said it so far. A spin orbital is a one electron wave function incorporating the spin part. Well, it is as simple as that it is not rocket science, but it is important to not forget that an orbital is for the n plus 1 at time a one electron wave function. A spin orbital in addition to having the uh, special coordinates for this one electron wave function also has the spin part right. So, uh, for two electron systems we have learnt that we can have uh, four spin functions alpha 1 alpha 2 beta 1 beta 2, but we cannot have alpha 1 beta 2 and beta 1 alpha 2 by themselves because we cannot distinguish between electron number 1 and electron number 2. So, we cannot say for sure that it is electron number 1 and electron not electron number 2 that has alpha spin. We cannot say for sure that it is electron number 2 and ele not electron number 1 that has beta spin. So, the best we can do is we can take linear combinations and while taking linear combinations uh, there is no reason why we should stick only to plus. A linear combination connecting the two terms by a minus sign is uh, equally acceptable. So, we have to take that as well and we have said that if you use exchange operator just ex interchange the labels then the uh, wave function with plus is symmetric with respect to exchange, the wave function with minus is anti-symmetric with respect to exchange. The reason why we worry about uh, whether the functions are symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to exchange is Pauli principle or sixth postulate of quantum mechanics which says that uh, for fermions like electrons the complete wave function of the system must be anti-symmetric with respect to exchange. So, psi of 1 and 2 must be equal to minus psi 2 1. If you interchange the labels 1 and 2 the wave function must change sign ok. Great. So, uh, what we are saying then is that uh, if the 2 electrons in 1s orbital had same spin then we would end up getting the function psi s 1 psi s 2 psi 1 s 1 psi 1 s 2 multiplied by alpha 1 alpha 2 which gives us uh, psi 1 1 2 would be equal to psi 2 1 it is not allowed. 
So, that is what leads to Pauli exclusion principle and we have uh, sort of taken this idea forward a little more by uh, looking at uh, stator determinants of uh, bigger atoms as well. This is where we stopped in the last module. Now let us talk about the excited states of helium. Okay. So let us start with an electron configuration. Um, what is a state? A state at least as a first approximation is determined by the electron configuration. Okay. So we are going to have some excited state corresponding to say 1s1, 2s1 configuration. But as we will see a particular configuration can give rise to different states right? that we will see in a moment. But let us start. How do I write a wave function for a state with electron configuration 1s1, 2s1? I can write 1s then 1 in brackets multiplied by 2s, 2 in brackets. Okay? The problem is what this implies once again is that it is electron number 1 in 1s orbital, electron number 2 in 2s orbital and not vice versa. Who has told you that this is going to be the case? As we said earlier, electron numbers 1 and 2 are indistinguishable. 1 and 2 are labels that we are using to formulate the mathematical problem. So, if we just write 1s1, 2s2, then our description would be incomplete. We must write 1s2, 2s1 as well and then as we have done in the earlier scenario, we have to take plus and minus combinations of these two wave functions. Okay? So, uh, since we cannot say which which is which, again this is becoming a cliche, we have to consider this, this wave function with a plus sign and also this wave function with a minus sign. So, right away you see that corresponding to a single uh, electron configuration for helium excited state 1s1, 2s1, I have generated two wave functions only while considering the spatial part. I have not even talked about spin yet. Only by spatial part I have constructed two wave functions and it is not very difficult to see that the first one is symmetric and the second one is antisymmetric. Now knowing Pauli principle our job should be simple. We know that the total wave function has to be antisymmetric. Now see a symmetric function multiplied by another symmetric function gives you a symmetric function. An antisymmetric function multiplied by an antisymmetric function gives you a symmetric function. A symmetric function multiplied by an antisymmetric function or vice versa gives you an anti-symmetric function. So now see in order to ensure that the total wave function is anti-symmetric, the symmetric spatial part must be multiplied by an anti-symmetric spin part. Yeah? Now uh, you might remember uh, what the spin wave functions are for a 2 electron system. Remember we had said uh, you can write alpha 1, alpha 2 or you can write beta 1, beta 2, you can write 1 by root 2, alpha 1, beta 2 plus beta 1, alpha 2 and you can write 1 by root 2, alpha 1, beta 2 minus beta 1 alpha 2. Great. Now these 3 wave functions are symmetric with respect to exchange. This lone wave function is anti-symmetric with respect to exchange and here the spatial part is symmetric. So in order to have an anti-symmetric total wave function it is imperative that the spin part has to be antisymmetric. Okay? So the only choice we have for this spatial part is this alpha 1 beta 2 minus beta 1 alpha 2 function. This is called the s equal to 0 ms equal to 0 state, we will come to that shortly. 
But before that let us see what happens for uh, this spatial part where there is a minus sign. This itself is anti-symmetric. So, uh, we have to multiply it by one of the symmetric functions. We can multiply it by alpha 1 beta 1. No, what am I saying? It, I, we can multiply it by alpha 1 alpha 2 or beta 1 beta 2 or alpha 1 beta 2 plus beta 1 alpha 2 multiplied by 1 by root 2. All these three functions can be multiplied. Okay. So, what do you do? What, what do you get? From the uh, symmetric spatial part we generate a single wave function. From the anti-symmetric part however, since we have 3 symmetric spin parts, I can I will generate 4 wave sorry 3 wave functions by multiplying this single spatial part by one of the 3 different symmetric spin parts of the wave function. Okay? Right. And then that is going this is going to be called the, the collection is called s equal to 1. The first one is called s equal to 1 m s equal to 1 state. Second one is s equal to 1 capital well capital s equal to 1 capital m s equal to 0 state. Third one is called capital s equal to 1 capital m s equal to minus 1 state. Uh, what does all this mean? Well before saying what it, the, all this means let us have a look and let us see whether it rings a bell. I have two quantum numbers a equal to 0 b equal to 0. Then the next one is a equal to 1 and for a equal to 1 b is equal to 0 and plus minus 1. Have you encountered this situation somewhere? Of course we have. Remember J and M rigid rotor, remember L and M hydrogen atom same thing when L equal to 0 ML has to be equal to 0, when L equal to 1 ML has to ML can be 0 plus 1 or minus 1. So, the same thing is there. So, what this capital S stands for really is the total angular momentum and capital MS stands for the z component of this total angular momentum. Okay. Once again um, this is a quantum mechanical phenomenon completely. However, as I told you uh, it is strange but it is true that uh, when you talk about spins you can actually get most of the things done by using a very simple uh, classical vector model where you just draw the angular momentum as an arrow of, of appropriate length. So, how do I depict this s equal to 0 state? Well, first of all I draw this arrow up spin. Okay. Now, uh, remember the angle right remember the angle that angle is same for all electrons. Okay. Now, when electron number 1 has alpha spin, electron number 2 has to have beta spin and vice versa. Okay. We have to look at individual terms. So, how do I depict this individual first term? When electron number 1 has up spin, electron number 2 has down spin. Okay. And in order to get s equal to 0, s you can think is a vector sum of the angular momenta of the two spins. So, these two have to be disposed along a straight line. Yes. So, uh, what I am saying is that if this is the angular momentum vector for atom number for electron number 1, this is the angular momentum vector for electron number 2. Do not forget that their phi values are not defined. Okay. Uh, in the classical picture they are assumed to be precessing like this. Okay. I do not like to confuse students by invoking this precession business too much. But uh, if you understand better what I am saying is that it is uh, both the up spin and the uh, down spin of electron numbers 1 and 2 are actually delocalized over all possible values of phi. But then they are delocalized in a correlated manner it is important to understand. Suppose you could freeze and measure you would always find that uh, the difference in phi's between the uh, angular momentum vector of 1 and angular momentum of vector of 2 is 180 degrees. Okay. Suppose I uh, for this situation I take projections on the x y plane. Do not forget where the x y plane is. Right. 
circle or something like this. This circle is in the xy plane. Suppose I drop a perpendicular, I draw a projection of the spin angular momentum of electron number 1 and I draw a projection of spin angular momentum of electron number 2. These two projections are going to be uh, opposite in direction in the x y plane that is what it means ok, they cancel each other ok. So, uh, of course, if you take z components then also one is up one is down they will cancel anyway that is why s equal to 0 and if s equal to 0 what is ms? ms is also equal to 0 because if the length of the arrow that you get by vector sum is 0 uh, what will the z component be it has to be 0 and nothing else. Next let us look at this s equal to 1 business. Here um, the vector model is something like this. S equal to 1 means what? It means that uh, the total length has to be 1. Yeah, they have to add up. So, the uh, first one alpha 1 alpha 2 is like this. Beta 1 beta 2 is like this. All right. What would be the z component of this case? You have added 2 remember this length is root 3 by 2 and the z component is plus half. This length is root 3 by 2 z component is plus half, half plus half what do you get? You get plus 1. Of course, you might ask if this is root 3 by 2 this is root 3 by 2 you just add them you get root 3 and not 1. So, that problem is actually there ok, but do not forget this is a very uh, qualitative classical picture ok. But z component is easy to understand, z component is definitely going to be 1. In this case, it is not difficult to see that z component is going to be minus 1. Now, if you draw like this, then you will get some uh, component along the x direction or whatever plane these two vectors are in. Okay. So, s will still be equal to 1, but ms has to be 0, right? Because the vector sum is going to be along, say, x axis or y axis or somewhere in the x y plane z component will be 0. So, this is roughly we have not really done the vector sum in very great detail, but roughly this is what the picture is this is why you call them capital S equal to 0, capital S equal to 1 and so on and so forth. We are going to come back to this later on uh, in a little more uh, detailed manner. Right. But for now we uh, have without saying it learned a very very important concept. See when, when the spatial part is symmetric as we said earlier the single anti-symmetric part has to be multiplied by it to get the total wave function. Okay. Since you get only one wave function for the spatial part this is called the singlet wave function. The state described by it is called the singlet state. What about this? Here the spatial part has minus sign fine, but you still have 1s and 2s orbitals. Does it matter whether electron number 2 or electron number 1 is in, elect in orbital 1 or uh, orbital 1s or orbital 2s? It does not. So, this energy of this state where the sign here is minus is going to be exactly the same as the energy uh, in this state. Okay. Unless you want to consider the energies of uh, unless you consider that there is interaction between spins and all that that is not there. So, we do not have to worry about that. Just think of the spatial part think of Schrodinger equation if you could solve Schrodinger equation here you have one electron in 1s one electron in 2s orbital same thing here look at the configuration they are the same. So, energies are same. So, energies of uh, these things are same and then uh, the energies of these 3 wave functions is definitely going to be the same because the uh, uh, sign here is different from what it is here. Are we saying that the energy of singlet and triplet are same? Actually no. From whatever we have discussed so far maybe you think the answer is yes and from what I said. But one thing we have not mentioned so far is what is the effect of spin to be considered when talking about energy. For that 
let me remind you of once again something that we have studied in high school. Remember Hund's maximum multiplicity rule states that have a greater multiplicity have a lower energy everything else being the same. Here you see uh, which one has greater multiplicity? This one has greater multiplicity. You might have studied multiplicity as 2s plus 1 and here that 2s plus 1 uh, this is the s that you talk about. So, 2s plus 1 in this case is 1, 2s plus 1 in this case is 3 not very difficult to see this is what you have learned. But what I am saying is that the singlet and triplet actually has got to do with the total number of wave functions associated with these states. For a singlet state where capital S equal to 0 you have only one single wave function. For a triplet state where capital S equal to 1 ms varies you have 3 wave functions that is why it is called triplet. And remember triplet has a lower energy because of Hund's rule it will suffice if we say that right now it is actually a little more complicated than that but right now we do not have to get into it. All right, so we have learned this very important concept of singlet and triplet states and perhaps this takes our understanding a little beyond this 2s plus 1 business. Now let us try to write the wave functions and let us see whether we can use our old friend slater determinant to write the wave functions of the excited states. To start with let us focus on uh, one of the triplet wave function. I start with this because uh, the answer is simple. And since we are not doing it for the first time we know already that the answer is going to be simple. The answer here is going to be more difficult because, because you see there are two terms right. So, here uh, I have two terms and I am multiplying it by another factor with one term. So, I am going to get two terms here I will get 4. So, let us start one by one 1 s 1 2 s 2 minus 1 s 2 2 s 1 multiplied by alpha 1 alpha 2. We will have four terms sorry we will have two terms each term will consist of four factors let us work out the first one 1 s 1 2 s 2 alpha 1 alpha 2 ok. So, we can write it as a determinant is not it we will write it as a determinant and we will write it in such a way that the determinant we write is going to be Slater determinant. So, what happens in Slater determinant what changes when you go from left to right in the in a row what changes when you go from uh, left from top to bottom in a column. I hope you remember in one case the label changes in one case the spin orbital changes. So, let me write what will the 1 1 element be the uh, term I have is 1 s 1 2 s 2 alpha 1 alpha 2. So, uh, we start with the lowest energy. So, we will write 1 s 1 alpha 1 here and in the diagonally opposite one we will write 2s2 alpha 2. So, since we are going diagonal uh, your label as well as spin orbital both change. So, this is what we will write 1s1 alpha 1 2s2 alpha 2. What will I write here and what will I write here? What changes when you go from left to right in state determinant? What changes when you go from top to bottom? When you go from top to bottom we write the same spin orbital change the label. When you go from left to right you change uh, the spin orbital and keep the label. So, this is the uh, state of determinantal form of the wave function for the 3 1 state state in which capital S equal to 3 and m s equal to 1. Now, I would like you to pause the video work out the uh, determinant for this one. Actually I do not want you to pause the video without do, pausing you should be able to tell me what the answer is. What would the answer be exactly the same treatment right instead of alpha we have to write beta. So, the answer is similar determinant wherever there is alpha we write beta that is your uh, psi 3 minus 1 state wave function for the state in which capital S is 3 so triplet and the z component of the angular momentum total angular momentum is minus 1 all right second one. Now, we are going to have not 2 but 4 terms. So, we are going to have to write a sum of 2 de determinants ok. But then uh, in every term we have we still have 4 factors. 
So, I can still write 2 by 2 determinants may be. Let us see what we get if you try to write this as a sum or difference of 2 determinants. Now, I want you to pause the video really and see whether you can write it in such a way that you get a linear combination of 2 Slater determinants. Can you do it please? I hope you have done it. I hope you had uh, stopped this video and you have done it and let us see if you have got the right answer. This is the answer 1 s 1 alpha 1 2 s 2 beta 2 minus 1 s 2 alpha 2 2 s 1 beta 1 plus half into 1 s 1 beta 1 2 s 1 alpha 1 1 s 2 beta 2 2 s 2 alpha 2. Stator determinant right when you go from left to right you keep the label when you go from top to bottom you change the label. Okay. So, this is uh, what you get for the triplet state for the uh, alpha alpha beta beta functions you get uh, stator determinants for the alpha beta plus beta alpha function you get a sum of 2 stator determinants. To conclude this discussion uh, let us see what we are going to write for the singlet wave function as you see the singlet wave function is almost identical well, almost identical is a uh, little oxymoronic uh, the, the singlet wave function is very very similar to the uh, s equal to 1 m s equal to 0 wave function. What is the difference? The difference is instead of plus here there we had a minus instead of minus here we had a plus that is all. So, this will also be uh, a linear combination of 2 determinants this is what it is going to be. Please work out yourself uh, these things you can understand only when you practice by yourself. Now let us compare the wave function for the 1 0 state to that of the 3 0 state what do we get right why am I written 1 0 it is actually 0 0 sorry 0 0 psi 0 0 state and psi 3 0 state same state of determinants. In the psi 0 0 case you have a minus sign between them in psi 3 0 case you have a plus sign between them that is what makes a difference. So, what we have managed to learn is that we can write spin orbital wave functions of multi electron atoms as Slater determinants or there uh, it is better to say linear combinations and this is if an extremely useful way of writing wave functions and it is also the starting point of more sophisticated treatments of multi electron systems. So, that is what we are going to discuss now and that is where we are uh, going to enter the uh, next phase of quantum mechanics because all these interactions are going to make things so complicated that uh, we have to invoke approximations. So far we have used approximations but they have been very very simple ones. Next we are going to talk about little more uh, rigorous applications uh, again rigorous application sounds strange. Uh, we are going to talk about more systematic detailed thorough approximation methods that are commonly used in quantum mechanics. We are going to talk about the variation method and we are going to discuss perturbation theory. Somewhere down the line if time permits if it fits in. I really would like to talk a little more about angular momentum until then.